on behalf of the American Foreign and Military Policy Cluster at the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. Thank you all for your virtual attendance today on this very cold and snowy day in central Ohio. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Jim Schnell, who is an Indochina cultural advisor uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And he also serves as a litigation consultant regarding Chinese espionage issues. Uh, almost makes me wish he was talking about that today. <laughs> but uh, uh, Jim completed his PhD at Ohio University, go Bobcats, and is a two-time Fulbright scholar to both Cambodia and Myanmar. And he has held full-time faculty appointments at Cleveland State, uh, Cincinnati, Miami University, and Ohio University. Uh, Jim retired from the U.S. Air Force Reserve at the rank of Colonel uh, with his final 14 years serving as an assistant Air Force attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Uh, he was born and raised in Gahanna, uh, five generations of family from there is what I've just learned, and has enjoyed periodic affiliation with the Ohio State University to include part-time teaching in the security and intelligence program. So welcome, Jim. Uh, the floor is yours, the virtual floor at any rate. Um, and you can go ahead and bring up your slides now by hitting the share screen button and then clicking on whatever box has your slides. Okay. There you go. And they are up. So I'm going right. to mute my camera and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you can see my screen. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the uh, introduction. Yes, I have uh, strong ties back in the uh, Columbus area. Uh, in fact, I'm always watching for opportunities to relocate up that way. I like North Carolina, but I'm a Buckeye at heart. Um, but yes, today I'm focusing on with, with my topic, uh, uh, the Myanmar radio television headquarters as illustration of army control of Myanmar government ministries. Uh, and they do this through isolation and infiltration. Uh, oddly enough, I uh, really just stumbled upon this, this topic. Uh, I was there... Uh, in Myanmar three years ago uh, with the Fulbright Scholar Program and um, uh, had nothing to do with my military background, my intelligence background. I was there working with this, the Ministry of Information, one of the uh, government ministries, and I was uh, helping them write manuals uh, for what they do, very much a bureaucratic, you know, uh, uh, almost encyclopedic uh, assignment. But anyway, while I was there, uh, given my military background, I, I recognized, got to know colleagues I'm working with, and I found that the military was just all over the place in civilian clothes in, in this uh, unit I was uh, assigned to. Uh, and I came to find out that this was going on across the ministries and um, uh, saw, I mean, how they were able to assert themselves. And, and even though the, you know, at that time, three years ago, uh, it was uh, very much civilian led uh, under uh, the leadership of the, what they call the state counselor, uh, San Su Ki, uh, that, um, that, the mil that the army had, you know, had a firm grasp on what was going on, decisions being made. But again, I'll get into this more as I move through my slides. Uh, I'm gonna assume, you know, in an audience like this, that there's a range of uh, understandings about Myanmar, but I'm gonna start with the least common denominator, basically that people would be somewhat familiar with Myanmar, uh, but not all that um, uh, aware of you know, the, the various dynamics, but this gives you an idea of where it sits within um, the Indochina uh, range of countries. And then the, the, the woman who's the, referred to as the state counselor uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, um, when I was there, was still very much uh, sharing power uh, with the military, but was removed from power uh, almost a little over a year ago. It was February 1st, uh, last February. And uh, there's been quite a reaction uh, against this within the United States and the international community overall. But uh, that made this, oddly enough, I, I just gave this presentation about a year and a half ago to 
the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And it was of interest then, but since the army has taken control of the country a year ago, that's where I've been uh, using this presentation more. There's been more interest I've been showing it. And that's where I, I sent it up to, to Pete at the uh, Mershon Center, because I thought, you know, now that the army has taken control of the country, this gives an idea of, of how, how this actually worked. And again, uh, I had a front row seat to see how they dominate the government ministries. Uh, but again, it was it wasn't by design. I just I just saw it happening, and I, I decided just to go ahead and document it as as best I can. But anyway, uh, again, if you followed this in the news, she's being prosecuted really for for, for trumped up uh, charges, and there's been a reaction, you know, uh, in the U.S. against this as far as seizing of their assets, that sort of thing. But anyway, a little historical context. Uh, if you know much about Myanmar. Um, and around 2005, it was when the military was ruling the country at that time, they abruptly just uprooted uh, the uh, government leadership from uh, Yangon, also known as Rangoon, and uh, moved them up about oh, 250 miles north to the jungle area uh, of what became the city called, uh, they referred to as Nepal. Jim, I'm sorry. I need you to unmute. Okay. Yeah, oh, you got it. About that. Oh, no problem. No problem. But anyway, um, they uh, just with gave them basically 48 hours. I, I talked to people I worked with, and they told me about this back in 2005. They're working in these government ministries, and this would be similar to be assigned to a, like a government ministry. Say, if you're in Washington D.C., and then. You're given. You're you're notified that you have 48 hours to, to move to this rural area. I mean, it would be like going to rural Appalachia or something like this. And when they say jungle, they mean jungle. I mean, it's 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 just out in the jungle where they they built this city up. Um, but then about 90 um, uh, miles from there is where, or 90 minute drive from there is where I was. But anyway, it, this was done when they uprooted the. Uh, government ministries, this was with very little rationale. They, they said it had to do with the threat of the United States may attack. Uh, there was, there's been talk that it had something to do with superstition, that sort of thing. But again, they were given 48 hours, very little notice just to pick up and go. And uh, the people I worked with where, where I was, with again, with the, the ministry I was assigned to said, yeah, yeah, I mean, they were just out in this jungle area and they're cutting down trees, trying to carve out a place for where they can work and they're living in huts, you know, tents and huts and that, that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, this is how, you know, the, you know, when the military controls the country this way, they can, they can take these sorts of actions. But in this jungle area is where I was assigned this Myanmar radio television, which is a, uh, the, the headquarters for their radio television functioning. And it's a subunit of the Ministry of Information. Uh, but uh, as I moved through this, I found that it's a representative illustration for how the Army practices their control of these government uh, agencies. And it's through isolation, just like I'm describing here, and then infiltration of the Army personnel into these government ministries. Now, when you see this big building here, you would think, well, it looks modern, that kind of thing. It is, this is like 90 minute drive from Naypyidaw, which is now the capital, um, which is not like a, like a city like we would think of it. I mean, it's, they've got this laid out, but it's, you're clearly in the jungle, even in the capital, but this is 90 minute drive from there. Um, and, you know, when you look at a picture like this, you think, well, yeah, you know, it looks fairly modern, but, but no, a lot of amenities, but not at all. It's surrounded by, uh, just jungle overgrowth. Um, uh, this is the entrance way there. And again, I was there to, uh, during the 2018, 2019 period uh, with this Fulbright Scholar uh, program. But I mean, out in this jungle areas, I mean, there's snakes and wild pigs and this kind of thing. So I, I, I just, I keep coming back to that when I show these slides that, you know, it looks modern, but you're clearly out in the, uh, in, in the wilds. Again, about a 90 minute drive from uh, Naypyidaw though. And uh, as I said earlier, it's carved out of this jungle area. 
uh, it goes back, you know, about 15, 16 years ago when, it, when this happened. Uh, but again, I describe it as almost a surreal travel from Naperdal to the MRTV facility and that it was, it, it's clearly isolated. And the longer I was there, the, and I'll go into this in the presentation, I came to see that there's really nowhere, it's ideal for having an iron clad or iron fist over the people and, and they're, they're functioning there, that there's really nowhere to be other than at work or in the residential compound that is nearby. Um, and that became apparent to me. So, uh, you know, I was very glad to visit there, but I was also kind of glad to know I wasn't going to be there the rest of my life. Uh, but these people, after a while, it, it's a very, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, interactions. People are just, it's not a lively place to be at all. There's not much laughter or enjoyment, that kind of thing. It's people working or going back and sleeping. I mean, people spend 14 hours a day at work just because there's, there's just nowhere else to be. But again, this is the isolation piece. And then I started observing the, the infiltration piece the longer I was there. But again, the Army holds these T positions at all levels of, of MRTV and exercises firm control within that. Now, this is the unit I work with. I work with the engineers. And uh, that's me in the middle. Uh, there you can see me. But there was, there were, I worked with seven other uh, fellows uh, in this group. And the two on the left uh, were from the Army, and the guy on the right, far right, uh, was Army. And the, the, how, how the, I came to, it started, I, I didn't know they were from the Army, but I could clearly see, oddly enough, they had the designation of being senior engineers, the two guys on the left, the one on the far right. And uh, it was strange, they were senior en engineers, but they really didn't know anything about what we were doing. Uh, the other four who were very quiet, quiet, introspective, had been around for years. You know, they had gone back to when they had been assigned in Yangon. Well, they were the, these were the guys who had the answers, but they were very quiet and they subordinated themselves to these other three fellows. Uh, and I just couldn't figure this out. Like, well, why is it these guys, uh, you know, I do a lot of work in China and I thought it reminded me of what I'd seen in, when I work in China, that people in the Communist Party uh, have a firm grip within organizations. And I, it seemed that way, but it even seemed more extreme. But then as I got to know them, oddly enough in this picture, you can see, or I don't know if you can tell it very well, but I'm retired military. And I, when I saw I was going to the jungle, I took my combat boots along, I had these old fatigue pants, uh, that were before the BDU uniform, and that's an Air Force shirt, but they recognized my military clothes. I had a military belt. And, I mean, they were quite complimentary about, hey, that, you know, I really like that, you know, you got that military belt. They know about our clothes. I ended up, when I left, I left all my uniform stuff there with them, but it wasn't that big of a secret that they worked for the Army. They freely told me uh, that they were, you know, working there as assignment for their Army. They'd only been there, they, they rotate in and out that sort of thing, you know, I'd be there for like two or three years and then move on. But anyway, so when I saw this, I just came to realize like, goodness, these people, it's just such a strange dynamic that the, the guys who really know what's going on are in the subordinate role, but the, the guys who have all the power, and by the way, are, are in these, you know, have the power, don't really know what's going on that much. I never got answers from them. They always referred me to other places, but with this, it just became um, apparent that uh, even before, the, whether it was military or not, I mean, the whole personalities of these army folks, uh, the demeanor, the, the, the way they carried themselves, uh, I mean, it was just a, a distinction, clearly black and white difference. Uh, but again, then when I came to find out, oh, it's military versus non-military, then I could freely engage in dialogue with those who were English speakers or knew a little bit of English and learn uh, more about how this works and how this functions on a day-to-day -day basis. But anyway, uh, going back to a little bit what I talked about earlier is that uh, this was ideal if you wanna maintain a firm grip on what's going on in the organization because there's only one of two places you could be there. And that was at work in your office domain or somewhere in that facility I showed you the picture of or you would be back in the dorm. And it was uh, really like dormitory housing. There were families living there, but it was kind of like uh, student housing would be at a university. 
I mean, but other than that, and they controlled who, you know, who was going, coming and going if you were trying to get out of town or, you know, try to get out of the complex, I should say, uh, that this was controlled. Um, and then again, how I came uh, to be functioning there, this, by the way, is the path that goes from the uh, ministry uh, compound to the residential area. So there's people traveling back and forth on this. And I found myself just in the middle of the day, just getting bored. Uh, so I'd walk back to you know the dorm room where I was, um, uh, but sometimes I just walk a few times a day just for something to do, and that's really how life there is. And you can always find people; they're not at the office. I mean, they're back in the residential uh, compound. But anyway, as a foreigner, um, I was surprised they let me stay there. Like again, I, when I first arrived there, the arrangement was that I would stay. Uh, it was like a 90 minute drive away. They had a driver and a car that was going to take me back and forth. Nobody had a car, but the organization did. But I think I kind of sensed this, that they didn't really want me around. They wanted me at the, at the working headquarters, but they didn't want me back in the residential area. They didn't want me having too much exposure. But when I saw this, I, uh, I just asked him, I said, you know, I, I don't want to do a 90 minute I don't want to be on the road three hours a day, um, but basically it was that far away just to find some place that would have anything remotely familiar to an American. Um, it was, and where they had me set up to stay would be, it would be like a day's in here in the United States. Uh, but anyway, um, I asked them, you know, if you'll just give me a room here at the, in the compound, uh, you know, you can keep the money. Um, and I think that's what spoke volumes is it was going to cost them like $100 a night in this hotel. There wasn't anything else like it around. Uh, and then the cost of transfer, transporting me back and forth. So they were able to pocket some significant money this way. And I think that helped them kind of re reshape their thinking that it wouldn't be too bad to have me around. Uh, but there was a, it was made clear to me I wasn't to take many pictures. Uh, but the longer I was there, the less problematic that became. Um, and I was able to take more pictures than I think they really um, had planned for. Uh, but anyway, even when I was there initially, I didn't think about this report that I'm putting together. But after a while, once I saw how the Army had their uh, uh, grasp on things, uh, that I thought, oh, yeah, this is, this is worth documenting. Uh, this guy, was, though, uh, while I was there, uh, this little hut, uh, right, was right outside of where I lived. And there was always somebody there. Uh, there. There would be different ones on different shifts, but there was always somebody there monitoring, you know, first it was because of my safety, but then I came to realize, oh, they're, they're kind of watching how I come and go and hey, nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a foreigner, you know, in their presence. But anyway, this was where, uh, where I stayed. Uh, uh, again, uh, very much enjoyed the experience as a social scientist, but I mean, we're surrounded by the you know, jungle, you know, all the critters that you would have out in an area like this. But knowing I was going to be leaving was eventually leaving. It was uh, uh, key to um, um, uh, dealing with uh, some of the, the uh, Spartan nature of where I was. But anyway, um, uh, very accommodating, very nice people, uh, safe, definitely safe, not, not a problem there. There wasn't really hardly any people around except for those of us working there. Uh, this is just a glimpse of where I stayed there. And this is a room uh, a view out the back door. Uh, but anyway, this provided me a really wonderful opportunity uh, for observing uh, how they functioned, how they lived, how they dealt with one another. And ultimately these constraints that were enforced uh, by the army. I can now see that this provided foundation for when uh, they took control of the country, you know, a year ago. This was in the period that within about a year and a half to two years prior to that, but they were well established for taking control of the country. And, you know, they had their tentacles into these government ministries this way that it was, you know, it would be a very good way to do that as far as ensuring getting what you want. Uh, you know, as, a, as, as far as the military point of view. But I very much came to view them as living with blinders on. Um, they didn't really, I think when you live in conditions like this for so long, you, you very much uh, just kind of learn that this is 
um, this is the way life is. There isn't much beyond this. And um, I, I've seen this kind of thing. I deal with China and Southeast Asia a lot. And I've seen versions of this, when, especially when I first started going to China back in the 80s, that when I was, I worked in the university over there, I saw a similar kind of mindset that the only news you get, you, you get in a context like this is, you know, the news they give you. Uh, but anyways, people are very docile, kind of sedate, not much action at all. Uh, just a very kind of mundane, peaceful, day-to-day -day kind of existence. This is the living conditions. It's more like a college dorm or a military barracks than, you know, like you would think of uh, as private apartments. And privacy, there's nothing quite like that. Uh, I got involved just for something to do. I was out for a walk uh, one day. I was on a path and crossed paths with a guy who was in a village, Thatar village that was about Oh, probably four miles away. And anyway, he was just real pleased to have a, a native English speaker. Uh, and he, so he had me come in and I, I, with my spare time, I'd go over there and teach English to the children. Uh, but getting to know the children kind of opened my eyes to um, really how, what it's like to live there. Oddly enough, the kids were, uh, they were quite lively. I mean, like kids anywhere, full of energy and curiosity. And uh, they soaked up my native speaking, uh, English speaking ability. That was my, that was my ticket um, with having some inroads just outside of the compound. And, and even in the compound, I, I freely taught English, but I, I worked with them a lot until the, there was a day, it was literally a day when uh, that ended, when uh, they made it known to me this wasn't to go on anymore. And uh, I obliged that. I didn't want to get anybody in, in trouble. But yeah, the kids, I would see them and Man, they would go the other direction. I, I, I could. I only guess that they told the told the kids that uh, that, that that foreigner eats small children or something because they they kept a, a clear distance from me. And again, I didn't want to cause any trouble, so I, yeah, I maintained a distance from them. But again, uh, until then, though, I, yeah, teaching English, there was this intense desire. Their teacher, who's in that picture with me, yeah, he he and I would meet in the evenings quietly. Uh, sometimes he would come over and meet me halfway. Uh, at night, uh, it was very dark, but I would meet him and we'd have conversations and he would tell me about what life was like there. Nothing, nothing breaking, I don't think any, any rules, nothing confidential that he shouldn't have, but basically just, uh, you know, I was, he, I was intrigued with how he learned English. And I, I've, since then I've, I've managed to, uh, oddly enough, even with the government taking control of the country, I managed to uh, send him money for, the, for, it's an orphanage school. Um, but uh, I managed to send him money through uh, Western Union. And even with the army having control, he doesn't have access to email that much. But when he does, I'm able to, to pass him, you know, Western Union, you pass him my name and a code, his name and a code, and you're, you're done. But anyway, I learned a lot uh, through him as far as what life is like there. But anyway, these are just some pictures of the kids and then uh, with him. Uh, his name's So Min Fu. This, though, with uh, for them living in the compound, this is the residential compound, and this is this is the dining area. Like if you're going out for a night of the town, this is it. And they they have these little food stands, and uh, this is their version of going out to a restaurant. Okay, uh, and so I spent uh, you know if I was going out for the evening, this is this is where I would go. Uh, you know, very small, you know, limited capacity. And right next to that was the community store. Not much in the way of amenities, but you could get soap, you could get shampoo, you could get some basics, uh, very much modeled after like a U.S. Uh, general store would be. Um, this is another stand where you could get things from. But, but other than that, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was Spartan. Um, Buddhism is the predominant religious faith, so there's a monastery that's about a one mile from there, uh, and I got to know them over there. The, my the fellow in the orphanage uh, took me over there sometimes and would, would show me around, but again, uh, uh, the Buddhist faith. This is a picture of it, uh, and by the way, the, the guy in the middle there with the white pants, uh, for me to be over there before they really 
uh, just flat out said, don't go over there anymore. Um, when it was in that middle range, he was the government minder who would go along with me and make sure I wasn't um, doing anything that I should not. Otherwise, that was, the, that was the monastery. And they have a local cemetery that, again, gives a glimpse into their uh, faith and how they practice that. This is the residential compound, though, very primitive by U.S. standards. Um, they didn't even have running water till about two years before my arrival, uh, no electricity and, and running water. So it's uh, good enough that, you know, you could exist there, but it would be, uh, again, I, Spartan is the phrase I think I would use, but it was good by, by their community standards. Again, this Thaltar village that was nearby, literally he operated this orphanage, it's kind of a school orphanage, but he operated it in a barnyard. Uh, I mean, it was literally a barnyard um, that he pulled this off, um, and um, fascinating to see it. I mean, it really opened my eyes to how you can do education without, you know, much in the way of resources. But anyway, uh, again, this this the exercise control uh, the army did through this isolation and infiltration. So even in this area where people live, uh, you had this ironclad grasp in that everybody who's working there is living back in this area. So the, I found that they had elected officials within the village, but the elected officials ultimately report to the military and the military makes all the decisions. So they could elect whoever they wanted for leaders, but the leaders just reported to the military. So again, uh, I do a lot of work in China and very much like you would see in China, especially like uh, earlier before modernization in China, that that you would have you know community watch blocks and uh, people behaved in accordance with you know the standards set there. But anyway, again, with it, this type of construct, um, non-military people just cannot ascend to higher positions of authority. You you can seek to be a like a neighborhood representative, but you're only going to be reporting to the army, you know, anyway. So uh, a unique thing that just kept coming up in this is that you have these more uh, capable um, uh, staff that really kind of knew, what, you know, that these are the people who would answer my questions, who uh, were um, the untrained military people, but they would report to the military folks within the organization. And the longer I was there, I could clearly see uh, that at play, that it was it was within the group I worked and the ones next door. I did my best to get around the, the complex we were working in and, and found it to be the case that way. But again, uh, very peaceful, tranquil, but seemingly uninformed uh, you know, existence. Uh, again, when I'd go out for a walk during my early days there, I would come across these kids and they'd stop and I'd teach them some English. But again, when uh, it was decided this should not be going on, then that all went out the window. Uh, but this was, um, I periodically meet this guy who was a teacher there, or ran this orphanage. And we would meet about halfway between where I was and halfway where he was and um, have a visit sometime. Again, nothing too far out of the ordinary. I was just interested in you know how they how they function there and how they got access to outside news or anything like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, just to draw this picture, you get you have this um, compound, and then you have the, uh, uh, the residential compound, and you have the work, you know, the ministry compound. Uh, but outside of that, I just could not get over, and I'm beating that drum incessantly here in this presentation that. I mean, they were they were surrounded by uh, this jungle. I mean, like you know, uh, just old. I mean, not modernized at all. Now, over time, I, I don't know what that will look like, but this is this is this is what the scene is like. And uh, like nobody has cars, but you will see motor scooters, definitely bicycles, junky bicycles at that. Uh, but within this, it, it was just easy pickings. Uh, for the army, I think, to main, maintain control there. But again, the, uh, my main uh, fellow I reported to, he was on the far left in that picture I showed earlier, was Bobo. Uh, and this illustrates this, uh, it offers illustration of an army soldier who holds a senior engineer position, uh, but does not have engineering experience. 
um, this guy, I, I, oh, and by the way, like after a while, I mean, there were ways I could kind of confirm, you know, what I thought I was observing, but all of the people who were really engineers and knew what they were doing, I would ask them, and I would just be visiting one-on-one, -on -one, like, how did you, you know, get into this? And they would start off that the people who were really engineers that had really been there long-term had been apprentices there. You know, they had, they had apprenticed there, they had learned and they'd been there for years, but they had learned the basics and then kind of worked their way up into the organization and ultimately earned the title engineer. Whereas when I was talking with army people, um, they, they would say, so, the common answer was, uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper, um, that was it. Or others would just tell you, yeah, I'm in the army, this is my assignment, I'm just here for a little while, you know, a couple, three years, that kind of thing. But again, uh, those uh, in the unit I was in, held the senior engineer title. And the, the real engineers just held the title engineer. But anyway, uh, this is that picture again, you know, a little bit more closer up where Bobo and the fellow next to him, these two on the left, and then the guy on the far right um, are the, uh, the army uh, folks who are the army uh, appointees. Uh, but I got to know Bobo the best. He was the one who was really responsible for me. He was the one that made it clear I was not supposed to go over and teach English anymore. Uh, and he was the one who I took my marching orders from. But uh, one of the things he kept bringing up with me was, you know, he had this intense desire to come vi visit Las Vegas. I mean, it, this was almost like something out of like a Wayne's World movie or something where I'm out there and I'm like, yeah, Las Vegas, yeah, I'll see what I can work out, <laughs> you know. You know. Um, but, uh, and this is my last words to him was part of this conversation. Uh, but anyway, I thought it best not to follow through on that idea. But anyway, he would make it clear to me in very direct terms. I mean, he'd look me dead in the eye and say, you know, uh, in broken English, but this is not to happen. You know, that, that it, you know, what was okay and what wasn't if I was taking too many pictures or something, but he was the guy who kept, kept an eye on me. Now, the bigger picture here, uh, is that the MRTV complex functions within relative calm. Uh, you know, it's very tranquil. But outside of that, you have genocide going on in other areas of the country. Um, that, that the Rohingya uh, is an ethnic minority that is just uh, persecuted, uh, murdered for that matter. I mean, uh, just terrible uh, persecution. Uh, and the army is actively involved. And otherwise, nice, pleasant people. Um, you know, I'd be these are people I work with, I hate with, uh, just get to know around the community. When I mention the Rohingya, I mean, you would think, I mean, I, I, you would think I was talking about termites or something. Uh, I mean, they, they're clearly not recognized as being uh, on par with the other people in, in that society. I mean, they it, otherwise, very nice people would just kind of sneer when they talked about them if I brought them up. And it was a sensitive topic, so I, I wouldn't go into it uh, too far. But anyway, the persecution of the Rohingya, if, if you followed this all in the news, has prompted this uh, reaction from the, the global Muslim community and, and you know, the international community overall. I mean, they're literally, uh, it's genocide. And the army enhances their position within Myanmar by engaging in this persecution. That's one of the ways that they enhance their standing, their popularity, which is waning now. I mean, the army's uh, really under, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad feeling about the army with the army taking control of the country as they have. Uh, but, but before that though, that was one of the ways that the army enhanced their position in Myanmar society was to persecute the, the Rohingya. So even though I'm in this, almost uh, um, tranquil, almost utopian rural area, uh, utopian as far as just quiet uh, lifestyle. Uh, beyond that, you have this, this intense persecution going on. So it's this strange kind of uh, orientation where uh, the Rohingya has to, they have to look to the, uh, uh, to the army, both for security but also fight them off, okay? So uh, this was, when I was over there, the inter there was great international interest in the Rohingya. So that's where 
I looked in that direction a lot more. And this business of just happened to notice what's going on with the army infiltrating uh, didn't really strike me as that relevant. I don't know, it was just something I noticed. But again, when the army took control of the country, then I thought, oh, well, this really is relevant. So I, it wasn't something that I was thought about all that much when I was there. I thought it, it was really just annoying more than anything else. Uh, but anyway, this shows the military. This is not me taking the picture, by the way. I get it from other sources. But I mean, these are army sword, soldiers uh, torching a Rohingya uh, village. So again, it, there, um, there's, uh, even before the army took control, there's significant violence that goes on there in the form of, um, of uh, genocide, really. I don't know what else you could call it than that. And the international community is, is, is playing a significant role in, in trying to improve, improve the, the plight uh, of them because it's literally uh, atrocities. But anyway, um, this military coup um, will continue to focus uh, world attention on, on Myanmar. And obviously the United States is seeking to promote the restoration of civilian rule and to, to minimize, minimize ultimately the Chinese influence in Myanmar. And I should mention, I did see Chinese influence there. There were Chinese there uh, when I was there. I was the only foreigner that was consistently there. There was a fellow from like North Korea who came through. I got to know him. Uh, oddly enough, our countries don't get along very well, but I got along fine with him. Got the, you know, we were foreigners, so we kind of were put together that way. Um, but anyway, I, then there was Chinese would come through from time to time. And I could clearly see that the Chinese were there almost in the form of like advisors. And um, uh, I, I, I would spend some time kind of around them um, and saw that, 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 um, that there was linkages there. And, and China does have you know, official linkages with Myanmar, but I was interested to see within the government ministry how that played out. One thing I'll throw, last thing I'll throw in on this and, and then uh, open it up for some questions is, uh, I, oddly enough, this is a male dominated social order. And uh, in the unit I worked in was uh, engineers and then the, the senior engineers who were army, but periodically there'd be a question definitely that the senior engineers couldn't answer because they didn't have expertise. But the engineers sometimes would kind of go, eh, I don't know what that is. We'll have to check with the senior office. And they would go in and talk to the, you know, the, the person in the senior office. And I thought, eh, I'd really like to meet this guy. Um, but I, I couldn't seem to get access to him. I mean, I, I would go in and I would talk. To, there was a secretary there, but I couldn't you know, get past that. But anyway, uh, this secretary, one time I was over in the, um, the orphanage over there teaching English. And she came in, I don't know what she was doing, I, I, a nephew or something, maybe was there getting, uh, I don't know, babysitting or something. But I saw she had a car. And it really, I'm like, how did that happen? I mean, nobody has a car, but she had a car. And I got to talking with her and I came to find out she runs the engineering program, uh, but she's uh, a woman and they can't have that uh, according to their social norms. Uh, uh, in that setting anyway. So she was just this quietly kind of behind the scenes. And I, I ended up getting to know her somewhat. She knew how to behave and stuff, but I interviewed her and I ended up getting an article published about her. It's a journal up, at, it's the uh, International Journal of Ethical Leadership. Uh, it's based up at uh, Case Western Reserve University up in Cleveland. But anyway, again, it was just more of this mystery that at the top of this is this woman who kind of operates behind Secret, you know, secretly almost behind closed doors. Hey, but anyway, um, enough of me. Uh, there's a chat box here. I'll go ahead and. Oh, uh, Jim. Jim. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I need you to stop. Stop the sharing of your slides right now. Okay. And then this is a discussion group, so I would ask everyone to go ahead and turn on your cameras. And um, once once the slides are off the screen, I can call on you and you can uh, ask your questions uh, out loud. So. Jim, at the top of your screen, there should be a stop sharing. Stop sharing. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, at the bottom here. Okay. Right. Yeah. There we go. Sure. Excellent. Um, so if everyone wants to turn on their cameras and participate, uh, but Jim, go ahead and uh, start with the question in the chat box, which is, 
the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, can they have any influence on what's happening in Myanmar? You know, the, since I have been there, since I was there, since <clears> that time, uh, I travel to Vietnam a lot. I'm working on a, a book with a guy over there. And I ask him about that. Like what I took, you know, when I saw, observed this, you know, v Vietnam is not that far from Myanmar. You know, it's in the region. Uh, and he said, even within the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, that they are not, you know, that they'll, they don't adhere to dictates from them, that they, that they, you know, they're part of it, but they kind of take what they want and somewhat ignore the rest. But he said that they are not, you know, they would not be like Thailand or, or you know, lesser degree Cambodia perhaps, uh, but that, you know, they're part, they're associated with it, but not, but not actively to the point that they're not gonna be told what to do. Okay. Um, if you have a question, you can um, raise your hand or uh, otherwise. Uh, I, I want to, yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, would you talk a little bit more about the ethnic issues? It sounds like basically all the Buddhists hate all the Rohingyas. And then there's other groups, such as the Karens, who have been fighting since 1948 and so forth. So what the ethnic makeup of the of the country as a whole is, and what ability there is, for example, yeah, the, some of the yeah. protesters are trying to join, sign up with some of these rebel groups, and that may not be a very good idea, particularly if they're considered, considered you know, cockroaches or something by the general yeah. population. What I can tell you about a unique aspect of the ethnic ethnic makeup there. Um, where I was, I, could, we, I would get out every once in a while, I'd go hiking around. And something I found, like if I got five miles away, was it really intrigued me is that you don't get the ethnic, I mean, different regions of the country kind of have different ethnic compositions, but they're very geographically very close to each other, that, that you can be geographically close to another ethnic group, but, but not interact with them. I mean, you can have stark differences with uh, people that are maybe 20 miles away. Um, so there's a variety of groups. Yeah, and Buddhism is, is you know, at the, at the top of the, of the ladder uh, as far as religious orientation goes. But, there, oh, there's a variety of ethnic uh, you know, makeup there. But the key, I, I, I just found it very interesting that that there are like there's places that that there's people that have lived there for years where I was who hadn't been like maybe 20 miles to the west because well that's a that's a different kind of group out there. Uh, and I would hear sometimes at night the sound would carry over that there were there were villages that were within, I could hear them, but I mean, they would have like just real loud beating of drums. I mean, it'd be three in the morning or something. I'd be like, what's, what is that? And they would say, well, I don't know. It's, it's just one of the other villages. Uh, and I came to find that they, that they literally did not know. But anyway, but to answer your question, I did learn this. I worked with the MRTV, the Ministry of Radio and Television. And I found that one of the challenges they had they're dealing with old, very old equipment, broadcast equipment. And I found that they were not able to get in and, and like convey their programming. Like I, to, in my mind, you would have programming directed towards one area. And then you might have different kind of programming depending on the composition of another area. Uh, you know, like in the United States, you might have an urban, you know, something, uh, you know, uh, that would appeal to people that live within the uh, tuning range of your radio station. But they said they couldn't do this because they had, they had distinctly different ethnic groups who would be living in physically fairly close. There would be a buffer between them. 
but uh, but not, I mean, enough that, that it would be different languages uh, even. So I can't tell you very much about the specific groups because me and Mars, really, that's not my main area of research, but I can tell you it, it is a unique feature that they, that, they, that they can be living relatively close to one another, but be um, significantly different. Uh, by the way, I found this to be true. I just, I was in Kosovo uh, earlier, just actually just came back last month. And I, I was surprised to see that. That's not my main research here, but I was over in uh, Pristina. Uh, but I saw that between, with the Albanians and the Serbs. I mean, they're, they're really geographically in a close area there, uh, but, but really radically different you know, orientation. Um, a reminder to everyone, if you feel inclined, turn on your camera and join the discussion group. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, Jim, while uh, other people are thinking about uh, what to ask you, I'd like to ask you about US interests in Burma, or I'm sorry, Myanmar. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. World War II scholar, what, what can I say? Yeah. Um, yeah. So other than the sort of humanitarian interest uh, in, you know, preventing genocide and, and caring for democracy and so forth, what are there any hard interests that the United States has from a realist perspective? Uh, why should we care? You know, um, when I first, I was there with the Fulbright Scholar Program, and when I arrived in country, um, I, was, yeah, I was in uh, Rangoon, for, uh, or they would call it Yangoon, um, for a couple of days. And I met with officials uh, from the Fulbright Program, you know, CIES, um, a Council for International Exchange of Scholars. And they specifically encouraged me. They said, you know, you're, you're an ambassador of the United States, you know, a, a person of goodwill extending right hand of fellowship out in this area. Uh, and they said, what we want you to do, what we're trying to do is open up uh, um, free enterprise as far as um, journalistic practices. So at the time I was there, I think um, basically what it came down to was, and it was a learning experience for me was that I'm going to the Ministry of Radio and Television, uh, something I should do if I'm so inclined is to encourage um, uh, like a free press. Uh, at the time I went there, I don't know if you remember, but there were two journalists from Reuters who were being uh, prosecuted. They were, there was a trial going on. It was right around that time period. And uh, anyway, there was a lot of sensitivity internationally that these were, uh, uh, the, these, these two journalists who were from Myanmar were going to be jailed it was trumped up charges, that kind of thing. So this was kind of in the air there. But I would say that my impression was there was a significant disconnect between um, what, I guess, foreign policy and how it was supposed to play there, and as far as what was real, it could realistically be expected. That I kind of nudged into this a little bit when I was working at the complex. And they just dismissed it like, like, like uh, it's a non-starter, like uh, barely, to the point that they barely understood what I was talking about when I would talk about like a free press. But I do think it, where, so I, where I'm kind of going back to is I had a limited uh, exposure to what US foreign policy would actually be in that region. But at the time I was there, it was, it was summed up in that I'm going to this ministry and that th this would be something I would want to promote. Uh, and that's understandable. I, I find that in other countries, you know, I'm, I'm in the, you know, this, the U.S. is basically, I, I, my view, you know, trying to promote our, our way of life, you know, uh, democratic, you know, uh, you know, voting, you know, that sort of thing. That was my impression. But again, it's limited. So our interests in Burma are primarily humanitarian and democracy promotion. There's no, like, hard exports that, that are of concern to us, critical minerals or anything? Not that I, not, not that I was aware of at all. Um, I did ask around about that, you know, like, you know, if there were, you know, things that U.S. foreign policy that we, that we needed, you know, you're talking about natural resources. And um, no, that, that, that from what I was told that there wasn't anything um, that was driving us that way. 
Uh, I can tell you there was a great deal, of, I would almost say paranoia within the country that the US was gonna be invading, uh, which is the reason they used for moving, you know, moving the, uh, the, the capital up into the jungle. So, Bur so Myanmar might not be the middle of nowhere, but you can see it from there. <laughs> yes, yes, good, good point, yes. Um, what's, what's, you know, what's at stake for China? Why does China want a closer relationship with Myanmar? You know, it's remarkable. I don't know, I don't know where, what kind of deep pockets China operates with, but, you know, that, I, down at Fort Bragg, that's, that's what I, I'm called into, you know, I, I make my living down at Fort Bragg explaining Chinese phenomena to Americans, you know, to the troops down there and to the organizations, planners, that sort of thing. And there's just a never ending interest in uh, uh, Chinese uh, influence. Uh, I just gave a presentation yesterday about Chinese levers of influence in the region, Southeast Asia. But anyway, um, there, it's something, you know, uh, earlier this week, I gave, I gave a presentation about the Solomon Islands, you know, Southwest Pacific, uh, Oceana. And that's not even part of the Belt and Road Initiative, but I mean, there's a heavy outlay of resources that's going in where the Chinese are building ports, uh, you know, shipping ports, uh, things with bridges, roads, uh, 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 pipelines, uh, you, know, uh, you know, inland. But anyway, uh, it's almost like the Chinese are just on, um, I mean, really on a, an, I mean, a, got an angle here. I mean, where there, it's an intense outwardness as far as, you know, establishing ties in other areas. And I, I don't know if people on, on this line follow much with the Belt and Road Initiative, but they're, I mean, they're sinking a lot of money into these points, uh, the per, point, you know, the pearls, they call them. Uh, on the map as far as the ports that are going to be part of the, uh, uh, the, the um, maritime linkages. But in Myanmar, again, I saw, I'm like, what's in it for them here? I think what they get there for the most part is that there is, um, it's a country, it re, Myanmar present day, three years ago, reminded me of China back 40 years ago, when I was there 40 years ago that it was very much people living with blinders on, you know, uh, uh, didn't know much more than what they were told by the government, that kind of thing. Now, China's changed since then. But with Myanmar, I think China sees an ally there, that this is, yeah, firm government control, army control. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, that there's not a lot of questioning going on, or if people do question it much, they're going to disappear in the night. Uh, so I, I saw it with the Chinese who came in there, uh, that these were fairly serious minded Chinese who came in and they were lending their expertise uh, in that region. But something I've seen with the Chinese definitely in Vietnam uh, is that uh, I, never, I never mistake that for like uh, a relationship that's overly strong. I think the Chinese are very pragmatic, that they're, they're going to use the uh, Myanmar uh, to, to their benefit. Myanmar is gonna use them to a benefit, but I don't think there's a, a strong feeling of brotherhood uh, that exists there, but it's more like a pragmatic, this is what we can get from this. And by the way, something I'll, I'll end with on that question is uh, that there's such a history of China dominating that region. I mean, thousands of years uh, you know, back historically that I find all of Southeast Asia is very uh, uncomfortable, suspicious of Chinese overtures in the region. I think China would probably enjoy dominating the region once again, just the end of its foreign policy. Uh, there is a question in the chat box about your experience with Christian missionaries that might have been in Myanmar and their expression of humanitarian concerns. Did you have any uh, exposure to Christian missionaries in the country? You know. I'm just looking through this question. Da, 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 da. Uh, what was my experience of the historic Christian denominations and their expressions? Okay, of humanitarian, humanitarian concerns. Um, I didn't see any. Uh, but again, I was out. I was out in the countryside. I mean, I was out in the jungle. So uh, I never saw another American. Uh, I, I saw when I was at the U.S. Embassy. I did, but once I left there, never saw. No, I didn't see any other foreigners. There was a North Korean fellow. 
uh, Chinese I, I saw uh, at the compound, but I never again um, uh, till I went into Nepetal to, to leave at the airport. But um, I, I can't imagine Myanmar letting you know much loose there as far as having uh, Christian missionaries in the region. Oddly enough, though, it's strange how this works, come to think of it. There was a guy who worked at the compound, who worked in the ministry I did. And he uh, approached me one night. I was out by myself, sitting by myself. Um, and he came up. It was just the two of us. And uh, he started telling me that he had been educated by, uh, it was another country in Southeast Asia, but he had been educated by Catholic, um, like Jesuits or something. Uh, and I used to teach at a Catholic college. Um, and so I was, I'm not Catholic, but I could talk with him a little bit about this. But anyway, this is just really how life worked there. We got to talking. Uh, he had a motor scooter and uh, I wanted to go over to the uh, orphanage that was nearby. And I, so I, I said, hey, why don't you give me a ride over there? And, you know, I, I just wanted to touch base with him, let him know I can't come over anymore. But anyway, he took me over. But when we came back, he was observed and uh, we never spoke again. But, but when, we, when we were talking, it was going, like, oh, yeah, we had to get together for dinner and stuff like this. I'd see him every once in a while, but I thought I could tell he there was no interaction after that. that he, it, the hammer kind of came down on him. But I was very surprised. He said he had, it was some other country in Southeast Asia that he had been there. His father had been assigned Myanmar, but outside of the country, uh, some other function. But his father was Myanmar. His parents were from Myanmar. But I was very surprised. He said he had been educated by, by uh, Jesuits. But uh, to answer the question, I saw nothing of missionaries, and I saw nothing that even resembled it. But my guess is there might be a presence in the cities, but like Yangon, but beyond that, you know, I would say, uh, I, don't, I don't know how that they could function because they're very sensitive to uh, you know, anything that has external influence. And with that, uh, we're going to have to end. Jim, thank you very much for being on today and for sharing your experiences as a Fulbright scholar in Myanmar. Um, I know I learned a little bit about a country that it might not be in the middle of nowhere, but you can see it from there. Um, yeah. And uh, I would like to remind our guests that uh, the next American Foreign Military Policy event is Thursday, February 17th. Seth Jones will present on his new book on Russia, China, Iran, and the rise of irregular warfare. It's 3.30 to 5 p.m. So check the Mershon website and register if you're interested. Uh, thank you all for your attendance and um, have a good snow day. <laughs>